today we are celebrating you know the 75th uh, um, years of independence and uh, what better could we have than to say that well not only have we outbeaten the country which used to say that the sun never sets there we have become the fifth, fifth largest economy and whom have we beaten uh, none other than those who have colonized us so this is one victory of your ours and leave alone that maybe we should uh, celebrate also how a person of indian origin is now serving as prime minister of that country that speaks volumes for what indians are now to come to the main uh, amrit mahotsav when the prime minister also made his statement he amongst other things what he said was that we are proud of our constitution and friends we have to be proud of our constitution enough of self flagellation enough of self criticism it is a time to tap our pat our backs and say that well we indians have fared fairly well maybe we haven't accomplished the ideal situation the ideal conditions but the journey so far is something which would be definitely enviable for many others now uh, if you look at our neighborhood especially the kind of instability in the neighborhood name the country begin from afghanistan or nepal or sri lanka or pakistan bangladesh bhutan name all the countries that you can and you will see vis a vis india the instability the turmoil the turbulence in these countries actually put us in contradistinction distinction to them them and make us one of the countries which can claim to be the most stable and why have we been stable why have we been able to conduct ourselves the way we have because we have had a wonderful constitution and this wonderful constitution of ours remember when we uh, i'm a student of political science of course i did my phd in gandhian philosophy but as a student of political science which is my uh, major discipline in that we have always been reading of books from of granville austin or iver jennings or for that matter d d basu and or all of them do claim that the constitution of india and leave alone only them even the politicians of different hues and colors they also claim that the constitution of india is a bag of borrowings we borrowed the directive principles from ireland we borrowed the parliamentary system from britain we borrowed the federal system from the us and uh, we borrowed so many features from the canadian uh, uh, constitution meaning thereby to say that oh there's nothing unique there's nothing original in the indian constitution in the constitution of india and it is more or less a borrowing we have borrowed certain institutional mechanisms maybe and yes rightly so but the indigenous spirit and the indigenous content of our constitution is remarkable and it is because of that remarkable spirit of indigeneity that our constitution has been able to function the way it has unlike most of the other countries in our neighborhood if we look at it we 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 talk of every we talk of and we have to give him his credit the father of the constitution who framed the constitution chairman of the drafting committee uh, dr b r ambedkar ji we shall always remain indebted to his contribution in devising and leading the entire constituent constituent assembly in framing a constitution which has stood up stood us in the stead of time but we also uh you know talk very highly and we should be talking very highly of all the constituent assembly members who sat there for 2 years 11 months and 17 days to frame the constitution after 1787 when the philadelphia after the philadelphia Conven convention where the united states america constitution was framed there has never been such a long marathon exercise to create a constitution very surprisingly in that constitution in that constituent assembly we have politi political leaders whose contribution has been immense who sat there and 
discussed, de deliberated, and there were all kinds of debates and discussions. And this is the only constitution which came up, which was finally readied and put into practice on the basis of accommodation and consensus. Without consensus, we did not agree to incorporate anything into the constitution, which did not have, if not unanimity, at least there has to be consensus. And amongst all those who sat there from different shades of uh, you know, political ideologies, there was one person missing in person there, and he was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, who was never in person a part of the constitution making and in the constituent assembly. But if we actually go through our constitution, try to analyze how it has functioned and how it has been constituted, the different provisions there, the underlying spirit of the constitution, I feel, and this is my personal view, which has been also been voiced by many other luminaries of uh, amongst the constitutional experts, that the most reverberating spirit and reverb resonant resonance of any voice that we can find is Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi did not come there. Gandhiji was not there in the Constituent Assembly. But let us remember, friends, that in 1922 itself, when he first pronounced that Swaraj could not be the gift of the British to India, of the British Parliament to India, but must spring from the people of India expressed through freely elected representatives. He announced this in 1922 itself, that this is not going to be a free gift from the parliament or British parliament. It has to be devised by, it has to be constituted by the people of India through their freely elected representatives. And see, after 24 years, we actually saw the day when such a constituent assembly was constituted. Maybe not the way we would ideally have wanted each one to be freely representative, uh, elected representative, but yes, there were some members who were not uh, elected in that manner. Provincial legislatures elected their members, but nonetheless, the constituent assembly did represent the Indian people and the Indian people's wishes and aspirations and desires. So amongst, other than that, well, while they were framing the Constitution of India, when they were deciding uh, to form the Constituent Assembly, I do not know how many of you know about it, but it, there have been uh, people who have been talking about it very, uh, uh, very recently, that they were considering to invite Professor Ivor Jennings, to, uh, Dr. Ivor Jennings, as a constitutional expert to uh, give leadership and advice in framing the constitution. When Mahatma Gandhi came to know of it, he said, why do we have to call a foreigner for that? He may be, I do not in any way take away from his constitutional expertise, but we have our own indigenous legal expert. And B.R. Ambedkar, who was a very strong critic of, uncompromising critic of Mahatma Gandhi, yet Gandhiji for the uh, well-being of the country for the great acumen that Dr. B.R. Ambedkar had acquired, respected him for it and found that he would be a better person than Ivy Ivor Jennings to actually guide us through that constitution making process. And therefore, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar was taken into the Constituent Assembly and his role definitely has been something that we have all been very appreciative of, very indebted to, and shall always re remain indebted because had he not been at the helm of affairs, probably we would have had not the kind of constitution that we are celebrating today. So if we see, uh, now if we see whether uh, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, he came in, he tried, he, he tried to give his uh, support, but if you look at him, did he ever visit the Constituent Assembly while it was functioning? In fact, it is rather surprising that in 1934 itself, he, he retired from the Congress. 
and he realized that the people leaders of the congress were not in consonance with the ideas that and ideals that he was taking forward and he realized that he was becoming a misfit there and he also realized that he had a lot to contribute through his constructive program in the country and so despite not being part of uh, the uh, constituent assembly not being a part of the active congress he was very active in the politics and leaders and he was an active leader of the country and whatever he voiced whether it was through his written words or whatever he expressed through his written word through his speeches through his different kind of memoranda etc et when whatever he had contributed those views were for the benefit of the country and the people for humanity at large and these were taken into cognizance whether it was the hind swaraj or his newspapers uh, or the harijan young india letters that he wrote to the different dignitaries etc and personal all those were taken into account but we have to remember that when uh, the in uh, the round table conference which was organized in the 30s 1931 gandhi was the, because uh, remember i told you we, in 34 he left the congress when he went to the round table conference he was the sole representative of congress at that point of time and when he went to the round table conference there he was the person who said he voiced his opinion and if you remember there was a design in organizing that round table conference where they were trying to create fissures between the indian populace on the lines of religion on the right lines of caste and this is where gandhi played a pivotal role in trying to overcome those barriers in trying to bridge those gaps create bridges between the indians and that is how uh, his that is history how the the mcdonald uh pack uh, how mcdonald uh, announced the the prime minister of the country announced the uh, communal award and gandhi sat on his fast unto death and he said i will not let it happen because he said after all are the untouchables going to remain untouchables in perpetuity kya ye sadaiv rahenge aisa aisa nahi hoga isliye we have and we cannot create more fissures meaning to say that in 1931 in that round table conference also during that conference he made his voice very clear that we need to have a constituent assembly and that constituent assembly has to frame our constitution and if this is not uh, taken into cognizance by the british i am willing to adopt direct action for that nothing short of a constituent assembly was acceptable to gandhi to frame that constitution now the constituent assembly was also framed and he said we have to develop a, create a constitution which is which incorporates the culture of our people which incorporates the uh, beliefs of our people which incorporates the wisdom of our people and which functions according to the full functions to fulfill the aspirations of our country and every country has its own uniqueness and india is the longest civilization and therefore this kind of a country which has been democratic in spirit we have been so democratic in spirit that that democracy should reflect in our constitution as well and because he was in the in favor of creating a constitution which was democratic in spirit created by the people of india and that is why we see that even in the aims and objectives of the resolution that was put forth by pandit jawaharlal nehru even in that we read real real we realize it begins with the phrase which became the preamble of india we the people of india meaning to say it is not a b or c who is making the constitution it is the representatives of the entire people they are not doing it in their individual capacity they are doing it as representatives of the people and therefore it is actually through the representatives the people of india who are framing the constitution so the very preamble of the constitution you will see mirrors the uh, ideals and the uh, objectives which gandhi stood for throughout his life he says now the basic things that we the people of india of course and he talks about what 
he talks about liberty justice equality now these ideals of liberty equality and justice these were these were ideals that every indian was aspiring for and gandhi led several kinds of movements and agitations and various kinds of petitions where he tried to acquire achieve this for the country along with the people of of the of the country so we see that in the preamble itself this is a unique constitution of the world where we talk of individual dignity and collective good in the same spirit in the same vein vyakti ki garima rashtriya ekta ye dono ka samagam ek swar mein hona ye bahut hi vilakshan yogdan hai bhartiya samvidhan ka और यही सामुदायिक हित की बात करना पर व्यक्ति की गरिमा से समझौता नहीं करना ये जो एक भारत के संविधान की एक विलक्षण जिसको हम कहते हैं योगदान है मानव सभ्यता के प्रति दैट इज समथिंग बिकॉज इफ यू सी बाई एंड लार्ज यू विल इफ देर आर देर इज एन इंडिविजुअलिस्टिक टीनर ऑफ अ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन कलेक्टिव गुड डज नॉट रिमेन इक्विवलेंट but here is a constitution where you find that individual dignity where the individual's liberty is also taken care of is to be provided for equality is also to be provided for justice is also to be provided for and in no means and neither on the basis of place of birth sex caste or uh, uh, whether it's educational qualification or anything else wealth nothing every individual shall remain equal now this is a concept which a country which was colonized for so long has not forgotten that we are a nation which had a culture which promoted equality and we learned to respect each other all along so this respect for each other irrespective of the religious orientation this respect for each other without any kind of condemnation or any kind of looking down upon people of the other uh, any other religion this respect for all religions religions which we call sarv dharm sambhav which has in some way been <clears throat> misrepresented and there is a lot of you know confusion around the term uh, secularism which does not connote the same thing which is connoted in the west we have a different connotation altogether because we cannot become anti religion or irreligion and for us dharma is not religion i do not want to enter into that terrain because that is an entire uh, uh, you know a complete a subject for a complete uh, many hours uh, discussion and deliberation but i just want to point out that we have to remember that this respect for all religions which even if we accept for the time being a uh, some kind of a connotation of secularism where we do not dis discriminate between religions if we limit ourselves even to that that has been something very inherent in our indian culture and therefore this inherent cultural notion of us this in inherent cultural practice of us finds resonance in our constitution because gandhi was one person who struggled all his life for communal harmony he struggled all his life for the removal of untouchability aur aap dekhiye ki part 3 of the constitution jahan fundamental rights ki baat ki gayi hai maulik adhikaron ki baat ki gayi hai उन मौलिक अधिकारों में भी अस्पृश्यता निवारण को इतनी प्राथमिकता प्रदान करना और समाज में समानता की स्थिति को उत्पन्न करना ये दिस काइंड ऑफ रिमूवल ऑफ अनटचेबिलिटी एंड एंड मेकिंग एंडेवर्स टू क्रिएट इक्वालिटी विद वन स्ट्रोक एंड सेइंग दैट दिस विल शैल बी अ पनिशेबल ऑफेंस फ्रेंड्स यू हैव टू रिमेंबर countries which became so called democratic attained democratic fruition in since 1787 itself they are still struggling to conquer the inherent uh, spirit of racism which finds prevalence in different pockets of the country so we may have as of now 
some aspects here and there where uh, we find that untouchability may have exist persisted but you do know that it, it is against the con constitution it's a punishable offense and this kind of a punishable offense being incorporated into the constitution what else can it be than a resonance of the gandhian spirit but when gandhi when we talk of the gandhian spirit i must bring into uh, focus that gandhi had a different kind of a political setup in mind and most of you gandhi is one person who's most read most interpreted and i don't think there is any person across the world jiske bare mein itna sahitya srijit kiya gaya ho jo unhone kaha aur nahi bhi kaha जो उन्होंने लिखा और नहीं भी लिखा पर हर व्यक्ति की अपनी अपनी प्रकार की व्याख्या होती है उसमें लोगों ने किया बट वॉट वी हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट गांधी वॉज अ पर्सन स्टिल वेरी वेरी फोकस टूवर्ड्स सोशल एंड इकोनॉमिक रेवोल्यूशन सोशल एंड इकोनॉमिक जो प्रोग्रेस है आप और हम जानते हैं कि उन्होंने तो ये तक कहना शुरू कर दिया कि अब स्वतंत्रता प्राप्ति हो गई है तय हो गया है अब कांग्रेस को अब इसको विरोधी दलों ने खूब भुनाया है उसकी खूब चर्चा भी होती है कि कांग्रेस शुड डिजोल्व इट सेल्फ डिसबैंड इट सेल्फ एंड एक्चुअली वॉट ही मेंट वॉज इट शुड ट्रांसफॉर्म इट सेल्फ इन टू अ लोक सेवक संघ एंड शुड वर्क फॉर द इकोनॉमिक एंड सोशल एमिलियोरेशन ऑफ द मासिस नाउ दिस काइंड ऑफ सोशल एंड इकोनॉमिक इकोनॉमिक एमिलियोरेशन we should understand that gandhi had a different perspective altogether and that different perspective was that village republics unka jo pura rajnitik pratiman tha wo rajnitik pratiman gramon par kendrit gramon par aadharit jisme swayat gram honge swashasit gram honge or elections would be conducted only at the village level direct elections and one more aspect before i forget when we talk of elections the aspect of adult suffrage that is again one aspect which gandhi harped upon and that adult suffrage has been see this is a very big achievement of uh, the indian people that there are constitutions there are countries which are still struggling only in the very late 70s and 80s that you be we find that many of the countries had been able to create universal adult fr franchise our country with one stroke created you know universal adult franchise and major credit has to be of course the people of the country after all let me clarify that gandhi represented the basic culture of india और वो जो अंतर्निहित तो भारतीय संस्कृति के का प्रतिनिधित्व तो गांधी करते थे इसीलिए जब हम कहते हैं कि गांधी ने भारतीय देशज ज्ञान का प्रतिनिधित्व तो किया तो वो देशज ज्ञान का प्रतिनिधित्व तो करना ये इस बात का द्योतक है कि गांधी वस्तुतः भारतीय ज्ञान परंपरा और भारतीय रीति नीति भारतीय संस्कृति में बहुत विश्वास रखते थे तथापि उस संस्कृति में अगर कोई विकृतियां उत्पन्न हो गई हैं कोई ऐसी मैल प्रैक्टिस ओरिजिनेट कर गई हैं, ही नेवर हेजिटेटेड इन स्ट्रगलिंग अगेंस्ट देम एंड रिमूविंग देम वेदर इट वाज अनटचेबिलिटी वेदर इट वाज अ बायस अगेंस्ट वुमेन वुमेन नॉट बीइंग गिवन प्रोमिनेंस इन दी पब्लिक एरिना एंड whether it was any kind of communal disharmony which was being created these were things which were not which were in contradiction to the basic culture therefore what i'm trying to tell you is that gandhi represented indian culture indian values indian beliefs and these are the indian values etc which find manifestation in gandhian spoken and written word and that is why certain things which he said at that particular point of time were very you know very uh, in consonance with what was prevailing at that time but which did not find favor in the constituent assembly later on ki gandhi ji ne koi swayam dwara wo uh, hind swaraj mein unhone apni sari baat wahan wo that's the magna carta of uh, uh, gandhian philosophy of rights and duties and political social economic Uh, model that he wanted to create but beyond that 
He never got the time. He was so preoccupied with other things that he was not able to do the work that he was not able to do the work that he was not able to do the work that he was not able to do the work that he was not able to do. Shriman Narayan, who was a principal of Commerce College of uh, Varda, he wrote a, some, a constitution based on the speeches and writings of Gandhi. And then he submitted it, a 60-page volume, and he submitted it to Gandhi and said, Gandhi ji, this is what I have you know, perceived, your, what you would like a constitution to be. And Gandhi ji read that and he said, yes. Largely, it is in agreement and it almost represents my views there. But I did not find to time to do that. But don't think that I have written it completely. But yes, in, a, in some way or the other, it kind of mirrors my expectations or my designs for framing a constitution. Usme, Gandhi ne, aur waise bhi, maukhik roop se bhi, jab wo jab jab afsar mila, to wo apne swar ko bhoat prakhar karte the, ki bhavishya ka bharat ka, jo sunahara pratifal agar hum dekhna chaate hai, to hume self-sufficient, self-administered, village republics par adharit ek vyavastha ka nirman kare, और उस व्यवस्था में पंचायत की प्राथमिकता होगी एडल्ट सफरेज से वहां इलेक्शन होगा फिर उनके जो लीडर्स हैं वो तालुक लेवल पर होंगे एंड तालुक लेवल से प्रोविंशियल लेवल पर एंड देन दे विल इलेक्ट दी सेंट्रल लेजिस्लेचर व्हिच व्हिच विल हैव वेरी फ्यू बिसाइड्स द फॉरेन रिलेशंस वगैरह उसके अतिरिक्त नहीं होगा बट आई जस्ट वांट टू टेल यू दैट व्हाई आई एम रेजिंग दिस इशू इज these issues were not taken into cognizance and were completely rejected by the constituent assembly when they began framing the constitution that is why we had two models either the gandhian model or based on the village republics or the euro american model which had the parliamentary system of government which had these modern institutions we, which we had become accustomed to for the past several years and decades and uh, more than a century and so therefore, what the Constituent Assembly at that point of time thought in its good sense to adopt the Euro-American model where we adopted the parliamentary system akin to the British system, but with a combination of the federal system of America. So these combinations then saw that the village republic system which Gandhi had propagated or propounded, that was not accepted at that point of time. It was only after a couple of months, a couple of weeks, that Rajendra Prasad ji realized that Gandhi ji ke us gramin vyavastha ka or gram kendrit jo vyavastha hai, uska to hum logo ne koi, hum logo ne dhyan nahi diya. Then he raised this issue in the Constituent Assembly. And when he raised this issue in the Constituent Assembly, then B. N. Rao ji outrightly rejected it. One, he said that it is completely in contradiction to what we have done. And now it has that aims and objectives resolution has already been decided. We have signed it. It has, and that draft constitution, I'm sorry, the draft constitution has been already being considered for examination and you know, consideration and whatever. So this cannot fit it. And as you all know, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was also strongly critical of this village-based republic system where he and Gandhi had complete difference of ideas on this system because he considered villages, if Ambedkar ji considered the villages as dens of localism, of conservatism, of orthodoxy, of you know backwardness, Gandhi considered them to be the seeds of progress where if uh, functioned according to the true spirit of the Indian culture, these villages could flower into uh, you know, a system and help create a system would become very self-reliant. And what today's Prime Minister says, Atmanir Bhar Bharat, he con conceived and perceived of a India, which was based on religion, but we rejected that. But then when, as I said, whether it is the fundamental rights, if you go into the uh, fundamental rights of India, you will see that most of in part three, right to liberty, equality, fraternity, or uh, uh, justice, whether it is, you know, where you have this right to uh, contest anything done uh, and, and which is justiciable, you go to court. These rights have been given and has that resonance of and reverberation of Gandhian spirit. 
But more than that, in part four of the constitution, where the directive principles of state policy have been dealt, these are non-justiciable. But when this was being dealt, that is the time when people raised this issue, whether it was Mahavir Pyagiji, he also raised this issue. There were um, uh, other luminaries of that um, uh, constituent assembly, the names of which I forget as of now, but they raised those issues and they tried to bring into the um, uh, Shibanla, Saxena ji, Kazi, uh, Sayyid Karimuddin ji, all of them raised these issues that we have to also can take into consideration the proposal of Gandhi ji. And then that was the time that if you see in the constituent, uh, in the constitution of India, part four of the constitution, director principles of state policy, whether it is promoting a uh, village uh, panchayat system that has been incorporated, Cottage industry ko promote karne ki, kuti rudyogon ko prosaik karne ke liye rajya kare karega. Remember, dear friends, Gandhi was one person who believed in the positive obligations of the state, not the negative restrictions of the state. He was one person who believed in the positive obligations, whether it is the, and these are non-justiciable rights. So he did not want to say, uh, unlike uh, like, uh, John Stuart Mill, he was a reluctant Democrat. He did not believe uh, too much in the uh, power of state. He was not a very strong votary of the power of state, but he realized that the state has to play a role. The minimum it plays, the better it is, the more autonomous society is, the better it is. And we have to create a system where we grow more self-sufficient without the intervention of the state as much as possible, but whenever and wherever read it, needed, it should not be a negative restriction of state authority, but it should be a positive prescription for state authority. And that is the time when he says these positive prescriptions would mean that the state should endeavor to promote cottage industries in the country, in the villages. The state should endeavor to create us to ensure that prohibition about something ki prohibition ko agar wo keh rahe hain intoxicating intoxicant drinks and drugs should be the state should ensure that unless and until for medicinal value and reasons these things should try to be prohibited which we see some states are experimenting with how successful they are that's a different story altogether but nonetheless this because he felt that you know succumbing to the a habit of uh, uh, liquor, getting addicted to liquor, consuming liquor in a in the manner it was it was being consumed was a deadly sin, and therefore he felt this kind of deadly sin should be in, done away with, and state should also make positive uh, take positive steps in doing that. Not only that, other than prohibition, even for women, special provisions for women and special provisions for children. Uh, uh, even when it comes to education, he talks of how primary and how education should be compulsory and free for children and how they should be taught through handicrafts. These non-justiciable rights that we talk of in the directive principles of state policy, many strong critics of Gandhi say, Gandhi ji ko consolation prize hai. We have to remember that now with the Keshwanand Bharti case, when it has been said that the constitution can be amended, but the amending power of the parliament will not change the basic structure of the constitution. And not only the basic structure of the constitution, if you also remember that long struggle between the parliament and the um, uh, judiciary, where it was decided that if the judiciary was all the time protecting the rights of the individuals because it was supposed to be the custodian of uh, the rights of the individuals and interpreter of the constitution though living in their ivory towers the judicial process was such that the judges most largely tried to protect individual rights and that was the time when parliament raised a hue and cry and it was a long battle when the parliament said these are positive prescriptions for us directive principles of state policy so when it comes to protection of right versus the common good of collective good of the people we have to take into cognizance the collective good of people and we do know that 
then non justiciable it may be have may have acquired that connotation but as of now we see that those positive prescriptions enshrined in the constitution of uh, india have gained more prominence as of date and even the states are and the judiciary also does not lag behind in trying to remind the states that these are also certain duties that have to be performed by the constitution by the parliament and the executive therefore they have also gained gained uh, prominence in the uh, functioning of the uh, constitutional institutions of india so if we see whether even as issue which was very close to the heart of uh, mahatma gandhi and that was banning of cow slaughter even a subject like that has been included in the constitution of india in the directive principles of state policy milch and drought cattle they should be protected not because there was uh, vociferous uh, you know uh, dissent regarding uh, from different uh, sections of society which had different religious orientation saying that no because they believe they had uh, they did not hesitate in having beef and they were against it then it was it had a consensus was arrived at that these are cattle which had economic value which had a lot of value to contribute because india was an is an agrarian was an agrarian country and they had their own economic value even for agriculture their value cannot be disputed and therefore uh, the uh, the state shall endeavor to prohibit cow slaughter and milch and drought cattle this was incorporated into to the constitution and uh, there can be arguments about it there have been lengthy debates there have been you know contradictory views on that but all said and done these subjects which were very close to the heart of uh, mahatma gandhi where he had raised a lot of issues concerning that and especially when it came to the distinctions of caste and where he says that in the fundamental rights itself it is said that whether it is the public wells there are restaurants or whether it is you know public entertainment uh, areas no pro place should be prohibited entry and access cannot be prohibited to anyone on the basis of birth or caste or whatever and these are issues whether we go into the third part of the constitution when it comes to fundamental rights and we go into the fourth part of the directive principles of uh, uh, state policy we will see that gandhi finds a lot of resonance over there a lot of importance has been given to him and when it comes to even uh, elections and franchise that is also one aspect where it has been where he has been given uh, cognizance and i just have i think one more minute just i'll take one more minute and i'll conclude satyakant ji that now that we talk of international peace gandhi was a apostle of non violence aaj bhi agar ukraine aur russia ke yuddh ke sandarbh mein bhinn bhinn mat ubhar kar aa rahe hain और ऐसे में किसी एक का साथ देना और नहीं देना इसके आक्षेप और आरोप और प्रत्यारोप लग रहे हैं लेकिन ऐसे में भी अगर देश के प्रधानमंत्री कहते हैं कि ये युद्ध का काल नहीं है युद्ध नहीं होना चाहिए ये वस्तुतः उस गांधी है या भारतीय उस जो संस्कृति है उसका प्रतिबिंबन है कि हम शांति में विश्वास करते हैं हम शांति के दूत हैं और चाहे वो कोविड uh, हुआ उसमें भी जो हमने सहयोग किया और वसुधैव कुटुंबकम के उस अवधारणा को हम अपने व्यवहार में परिलक्षित किया ये सभी भारतीय संस्कृति के को प्रतिबिंबित भी करते हैं और गांधी भारतीय संस्कृति का इससे बेहतर जीता जागता उदाहरण उस वक्त जो गांधी थे और आज भी हमारे लिए रखते हैं कि अगर आज आपको स्वच्छता अभियान करना है तो गांधी को स्मरण करके करना है अगर महिलाओं को विशेष अधिकार प्रदान करके उनको समुन्नत करना है तो हम गांधी को स्मरण करते हैं अगर हम बच्चों को विशेष अधिकार और उनको किसी भी हानिकारक व्यवसाय में ना लगा सके और उसमें के लिए अगर हम सक्रिय होते हैं तो ये गांधी दर्शन का प्रतिबिंबन है तो मैं ये इस बात के साथ अपनी वाणी को विराम दूंगी कि संभवतः हमने प्रत्यक्षतः गांधी के उस राजनीतिक पूरे प्रतिबिंब को वहां नहीं या प्रतिमान को वहां परिलक्षित नहीं किया अपने संविधान में लेकिन गांधी के चिंतन के स्वर 
उनकी उस जो हम कहते हैं ना आत्मिक स्वर हमारे संविधान के प्रावधानों में न केवल मुखर होते हैं बल्कि आज भी अगर भारत का संविधान और राजनीतिक व्यवस्था इस स्टेज पर पहुंच गया कि हम अपने अमृत महोत्सव के रूप में उसको सेलिब्रेट कर रहे हैं तो भाइयों और बहनों हमें गांधी के प्रति अपनी श्रद्धा व्यक्त करनी चाहिए या कम से कम आर इंडेटेडनेस हैड इट नॉट बीन फॉर हिम प्रोबेबली वी डू डेफिनेटली वुड हैव गेन्ड इंडिपेंडेंस बट दैट इंडिपेंडेंस एंड आर जर्नी would definitely have been different from what we have acquired till now and achieved till now thank you all for a patient hearing